You walk across a grassy plain, the sweet smell of wildflowers in the air. Their cheer feels overbearing. The overcast sky rumbles, a promise of rain. Every footfall is strain, sucking at your flagging energy. The backpack is heavy and full, containing the spoils of battle and your good set of armor. You're wearing a trashed exosuit. It's the only way you're able to carry it out of here. An exosuit is a rare find this far south, too good to leave behind. The torn fabric and shattered visor attest to the reluctance of Mr. Exosuit to relinquish his prize. In fairness, he shot first. And he had friends. They put up a hell of a fight. A growl ahead of you quickens your pulse. You wait, shotgun raised, scanning the bushes. Sweat breaks across your forehead. You're vulnerable. A face full of teeth bursts through the underbrush and is swiftly met with a double blast of a shotgun. You warily reload and continue trudging up the hill. Exhaustion is creeping up, and the pack ain't getting any lighter. You just want to be gone from this cursed place. Almost there, Yantar is just through the pass at the bottom of this slope. The scientists like you. They'll put you up until you figure out what you want to do about the exosuit. It's fixable, if you can get it to Rostock. The loose dirt scree almost sends you head first down the embankment. No time for rest, can't slow down. Almost there. The track to Yantar is within sight. From the folds of your breast pocket, the PDA crackles and a service disconnection warning tones. A cold shiver runs through your aching body and the hairs on your neck rise. A distant siren wails as angry clouds gather overhead. A sigh storm. You waste little time. Yantar is too far, the camp to the south is too far. You'd never make either, even unburdened. There's only one option. Reluctantly, you swap armor, drop the exosuit, and sprint. This'll be tight. A fresh surge of fear-induced adrenaline loosens the cramps in your legs. You skirt the edge of the swamp, noxious fumes rising off its fetid surface, the bubble and hiss of chemical anomalies drowned by the rising rumble overhead. This is a dangerous area to be careless in, but if you don't make cover, then you're as good as dog food. The shack is perched upon rotted stilts above the toxic waters, and its splintered wooden boards spark a fresh fear. Will this shelter be enough? It has to be. You bound up the boarded incline and rush through the door. The shack is empty. You head to the corner on the opposite side which has the fewest gaps and hunker down. The wait isn't long. Pulses of blue-white energy lance from the sky and impale the earth with mind-destroying power. With little else to do, you take inventory of your pack while keeping one eye on the doorway. Nervousness gnaws at your gut. No one else will be out in the storm, but you left a valuable set of armor in the middle of a well-worn track. Will it still be there when you return? After what feels like an eternity, the crash of the final pulse echoes across the zone, and the thunder subsides. The clouds unleash their pent-up payload, soothing the land after the assault. The world is left to lick its wounds. That was close. It was foolish to carry something so heavy without an escape plan. Such is life in the zone. Greed is default and for many, the first mistake is their last. For the rest, it's a salient reminder that greed and survival are competing faces of the same coin. You'd think there was a lesson to heed here, but shinies be shinies. I have other stories. I'll tell you another one later. I need to keep reminding myself that Stalker Anomaly is a mod, because it should be impossible for a mod to feel more feature complete and satisfying to play than oh, most yeah. AAA titles. Stalker Anomaly is a mod. Stalker Anomaly is a mod. A bunch of talented and passionate Stalker fans collaborated to make what can only be described as the penultimate Stalker modification pack. Anomaly melds a huge curated selection of fan-made content into a standalone serving of Stalker goodness. You heard right, standalone. No other Stalker games required. If that doesn't sound impressive, I'll break it down for you. Anomaly contains every area from all three original Stalker games, Shadow of Chernobyl, Clear Sky, and Call of Pripyat. 33 areas. Most of them huge in their own right and loaded with stuff to find, explore, and liberate from the mortal coil. 
Original assets, content, and game mechanisms have mostly survived, but almost every component of Stalker is overhauled. Textures and models are upgraded and crisp, a new X-ray engine purrs under the hood, allowing new effects including volumetric lighting and fog, and gameplay has been refined and many of the rough edges smoothed out. There are so many changes that it should feel like a different game. I mean, it's standalone content, if that wasn't a clue. It's reductive to call it a mod at this point, because there isn't much that's left untouched. This ain't just a dusting of the engine or upscaled textures. I'm not joking when I say that nothing was left untouched. Nothing. And yet, if you've played the original Stalker games, but it's been a while between drinks, you'll swear that this was how original Stalker played after a few short hours with Anomaly. The changes feel... right. I like to imagine that Stalker's original developers look at Anomaly and see a realisation of their original vision. With 14 years of industry growth and the absence of crunch that necessitated the premature release of the original game. If time is the greatest asset we have, Anomaly made the most of it. Anomaly didn't take 14 years to create, but it is built on a foundation of new ideas and endless refinement. If this is your first exposure to the Stalker franchise and you're wondering what the fuss is about, well, haven't you come to the right place? Not only can I say that Anomaly is the best place to start your Stalker journey, it's also, in my opinion, the best Stalker experience, period. No, I haven't played other Stalker mods. Yes, I know that other mods exist. Yes, I'd like to try them one day. But when Vision meets reality, buys it a drink and fireworks happen and Vision takes reality home and spanking is involved and they make an amazing little baby anomaly, uh... <clears throat> well, it's hard to dispute the result. That's... that's what I meant. Not an actual baby anomaly. Or an anomaly baby. Actually, an anomaly baby would be terrifying. Birthed from the crushed remains of careless stalkers and mutants. Someone should get on that. For those new to the franchise, I have only one thing to say. Get out of here, stalker. Sorry, inside joke. That was very cheeky-breaky of me. I'm on fire today. Look, I'll make one thing clear before we go further. The original games are absolutely worth your time. Anomaly is a lot to take in, even for zone veterans, and the original games offer a palatable difficulty curve and, with Shadow of Chernobyl, a somewhat interesting plot, even if it does blow its load early. If you've got the time and inclination, start there. But if Rent ate most of the gaming budget this month and the thought of diving into systems with little explanation seems daunting, well, I got you covered there too. If, after watching this video, you decide that Stalker Anomaly is your jam, check out the Ultimate Beginners tutorial on my Let's Play channel. Link is in the description. And for examples of these systems in action, watch my Loner to Legend series, where I extensively use the crafting system and cover every mechanic in the game. Blondie style. Enough pew pew of the car car. Roll the banner. The original Stalker trilogy had plots which were central to the experience, but players fell in love with the atmosphere, the immersive sim qualities of moment-to-moment -moment encounters and the survival elements. I'm deliberately using a brush so thick that I'm practically finger painting. I often hear the objectives atmospheric and survival tossed about like a hen's party dildo when people describe Stalker. While these qualities are true, they aren't precise or descriptive, and they don't clearly define the Stalker experience. Understanding Stalker's specific appeal is key to understanding and enjoying Anomaly. Anomaly expands the Stalker experience by orders of magnitude, and boasts a highly customizable and immersive way of exploring the zone that anyone can get behind. Shadow of Chernobyl, the first in the Stalker series, was set in the non-fiction region of the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. Shadow of Chernobyl wrote in a fictional second explosion emanating from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which released a horde of horrors and wonders into the zone. Anomalies, artifacts and mutants populated the zone in a way that played on fears about the effects of radiation, both old and new, on living creatures. Horrific, deformed creatures were sometimes unrecognisable from their original form, and they were dangerous even the former domestic pets and farm animals. 
Stalker introduced 2K Gen gamers to anomalies. Anomalies defied physics and nature, appearing as spatial distortions, sourceless electrical charges, bubbling toxic pools and other strange effects which defied regular explanation and proved harmful to living creatures. The zone should have been a place to avoid, if not for the mysterious artifacts that explorers returned with. The artifacts were oddly shaped, sometimes luminescent, and often affected the body of the wearer in strange ways, providing protection or boosts to basic human function. These finds drew scientific interest worldwide, and those with the adventuring spirit braved the zone to plumb its hazardous depths. These adventurers were collectively known as stalkers, people who pioneered the zone to recover rare prizes unseen anywhere else in nature. The term stalker is an acronym which stands for scavengers, trespassers, adventurers, loners, killers, explorers, and robbers. It's schlocky as hell, but there are clear in-game references to the 1979 movie of the same name, and I'm assuming that developers GSC Game World weren't fond of lawsuits. Shadow of Chernobyl saw players progress from the southern end of the zone to the north, with the Chernobyl power plant being the ultimate destination. Along the way, players braved mutants, bandits and anomalies while on the hunt for someone called Strelok. The bleak, post-apocalyptic tone of the world, the rusted reminders of Soviet influence, all heightened by an excellent moody soundtrack, hooked players, immersed them wholly in a decaying place unseen by most. This wasn't just a fantasy apocalypse. Chernobyl was the real deal, with credible gravitas. GSC even made the pilgrimage to record locations for the game, and what they returned with is so hauntingly accurate and believable that it felt like you were there, touring a 3D replica of the real thing. Liberties were taken, of course, but the aesthetic choices and art direction largely reflected reality. The world felt less gamified, and, as a result, more real. It was easy to suspend disbelief when good visual and level design did the heavy lifting. Darkness, claustrophobia, and a heightened sense of fatalism dogged the player, all punctuated by the black humour of stalkers who spent far too long in the zone. Underground environments were harrowing, with stretches of still blackness for dangerous mutants to lurk in. The player could bleed, they had to eat periodically, and enemies were punishingly difficult. This made mutant encounters terrifying, particularly when they caught you with your pants down. A sudden snarl and flash of fangs were the only warning you were likely to get as hungry eye shine filled your dying vision. Darkness and player squishiness brought other problems. Mutants became more dangerous at night, their attacks easily masked by the dark. Anomalies, hard to spot during the day, were virtually impossible to see at night, which meant that being crushed into a human Rubik's Cube was a real possibility. Stalker isn't an RPG. Not in the traditional sense, but it does feature progression and increased player power through the acquisition of better armor, guns, and artifacts. Progression to better equipment is tempered by logical limitations, such as ammo scarcity and differences in armor protection. Players gain another, more important layer of power through encounters with mutants, anomalies, other stalkers, and the world. Tarkov shares a similar knowledge is power learning curve. This differs from standard shooters where different guns are simply varieties of boom, or RPG shooters where player, weapon and enemy levels define fighting effectiveness. As player clarity improves, so does their competency in dealing with or avoiding threats, and survivability improves as a result. It's this feeling of earned competency and mastery that I believe underpins the goodwill among fans that Stalker is now legendary for. I first experienced competency awarded progression in the original Gothic game. Earning your first set of armor in Gothic is a big deal and its acquisition opens a lot of doors. Instead of throwing health into enemies to scale them with the player, Stalker introduces more dangerous mutants and more perilous environments. More dangerous stalkers exist too, and GSC scaled their difficulty by throwing them into squads and gearing them up with top tier armor and weapons. Taking them down was tough, but earned. There is a dark rain-soaked beauty to the zone, 
a quality to the experience that touches the soul and is as hard to put into words as the kaleidoscope of human emotion allows. It inspires moments of admiration and reflection when sunset kisses another day goodbye and the hungry mutants begin to stir. It begs a moment of caution as strange snarls echo through the peeling hallway of an abandoned military complex. It invokes horrified revulsion at the creature loping toward you, once human and now a cunning predator. It reveals a sense of time and place, transporting you back to Soviet slogans, propaganda, proud statues, and familiar coloured stripes peeling from plaster and concrete. The zone is a snapshot in time, whilst being shackled to its reclamative ravages. Rusted vehicles with flat tyres, crumbling homes with wood-fired ovens and spring beds, rusted industrial structures dumped in the middle of nowhere and looking all the world like they once belonged to a highly irradiated power plant. Video games typically balance gaming experience and gameplay mechanics. If it's pure, unfiltered gameplay that you're after, Stalker will disappoint. The original trilogy isn't a refined experience, and the combat isn't intrinsically good enough to stand on its own. Gameplay is inextricable from the experience, and the experience is the foundation of the franchise. I found a short journal entry on a recovered PDA in Anomaly. A stalker recounts how he was sucked toward a vortex anomaly and barely escaped. Since then, nightmares plague his sleep shudder images of the zone and its clandestine secrets. A similar ailment afflicts other stalkers who are hurt by anomalies, he hears. The zone takes root inside them, and they feel its barbed presence no matter where they go. This is the perfect analogy for the stalker experience. Anomaly addresses many of the gripes that fans had with the original games, and then some. If you have played the original games and they didn't quite hit the mark mechanically, Anomaly may win you over. Besides, it's free, so there's no excuse not to try it. The modding community have already pumped out thousands of mods to improve the experience even further. Alright, I think I've jawed long enough about the Stalker games of yesteryear. Let's get into the bolts of Anomaly. Get it? Bolts? Like, in the game? Not nuts and bolts, uh, d just, uh... Yeah, whatever. Now that we have a foundation for what Stalker is, how does Anomaly change things? I... I don't... I don't even know where to begin. I'm gonna finger paint again because if I list every little change we'll be here until the apocalypse. The biggest change is the zone itself. As I mentioned earlier, all the regions from previous games are here, and they're fully accessible. All the underground locations are here too, if Danger is your middle name. That's a hell of a lot of ground to cover. Hell, they even threw in a bunch of new areas that have never been seen before. The next big changes are dynamic infinite tasks and a living zone, where stalkers roam all regions in real time, fight, find artifacts, assault camps, hunt mutants, and die. These events appear in your PDA as random chatter, but their purpose is more than cosmetic. Visit the location someone was reported to have died and you'll find the body, usually picked clean by an opportunistic survivor. If you're in the same region you can leg it over to help, hinder, or just watch like the vulture everyone becomes. It's a small touch that breathes life into what could have been a sterile world. There's an option to turn the living zone off. I don't know why you'd want to play this way, unless the updated x-ray engine is crushing your computer's balls. Speaking of ball crushing, the X-Ray engine has been overhauled and dragged into modern gaming. Dynamic lighting, object shadows and higher resolution textures are the most notable result, but fog and moon phases, yes, phases of the moon, affect light and visibility. This is a big deal. Dynamic lighting not only looks pretty, stalkers and mutants now cast real-time shadows. And it does look pretty. Fog and moonlight are another dollop of ambient atmosphere and provide tense cat and mouse moments, transforming familiar locations to ghost-wreathed other worlds. I mean, it still looks like a game from the mid-2000s, but the dirt-stained frock has been swapped for a sexy black halter dress. Emissions, the rare and scripted phenomena from Shadow of Chernobyl, 
return in anomaly and are joined by psi storms. Both events occur roughly every 16 hours and force everyone into cover. Emissions emanate from the Chernobyl power plant. Their imminent arrival is preceded by a crackle and loss of signal on your PDA. An orange glow builds to the north, tendrils of light swirling above the Chernobyl power plant. Lightning ripples across the blighted sky. Then an explosion ripples outward, washing across the exclusion zone in scouring waves. Being outside of cover means death. Psi storms are a similar phenomena and no less deadly. They are akin to large pulses smiting the area in shafts of blue light. Anomalies, the titular hallmark of the series, have been reworked. There's an option to enable dynamic anomalies which will spawn in random locations after an emission or psi storm. Think you got a safe path through anomalies memorized? Think again, little meat chunk. Dynamic anomalies require keener attention to your surroundings, at all times. Anomaly clusters, tightly packed groups of like anomalies, are so ubiquitous that they have map markers. Artifacts now spawn almost exclusively within their maze-like density, meaning that a handful of bolts and brass balls are a must if you want valuable artifacts. Tiered artifacts are now invisible and only appear if your artifact detector is good enough to detect them. Get close enough and they're yours for the taking. Then you just gotta make it back out in one human shaped piece. It's no coincidence that they spawn near the center of anomaly clusters. Gonna have to work to get your grub now, son. And while we're talking about artifacts, they've been completely rebalanced. Trash tier artifacts join the cast. They fetch a decent price, but have no benefits or side effects. Tiered artifacts now irradiate their carrier. Lead-lined containers and artifact containers are needed to safely transport and use artifacts. And can I just say that I love this system? Tiered artifacts have also been completely respect from previous Stalker games. Anomaly introduces a crafting system. Many items, including weapons and armor, can be scrapped for components which are used to craft new items or repair existing ones. Junk is everywhere, but don't be so hasty in tossing it away. It could prove useful at a crafting vice. Crafting is a great system that grafts seamlessly with Stalker's gameplay and feels as though it always belonged. I'd love to see it expanded and refined for survivalist playthroughs, and I don't reckon it would take as much effort as some might think. Cooking joins the new cast of features, going hand in hand with an expanded mutant parts system. Kill a mutant, skin it, get some parts, the usual drill. Cook the meat you find and try not to sizzle your tonsils with radiation. Or, maybe your culinary creation has more benefits with none of the half-life. Ever wanted your own posse? Sure you have. Live the dream and recruit extra layers of flesh Kevlar to take up arms. Anomaly's companion system enables the recruiting of other stalkers to form a party. They never argue, but they sometimes ignore. A good option for people with a firm hand who don't mind flexing every now and again. Companions even carry your stuff and loot for you. Good lads. Just don't forget to get your stuff off them. Medications, food and drinks, it's all expanded. Dehydration and exhaustion are new systems which buy for your attention and there are a range of solutions to keep them under control. A new main questline takes you across the zone in search of Strelik and his team. There are three acts to the questline, and completing all acts unlocks three new factions to play as. Have you kept track? That's a lot to absorb, and all of these systems have complexities. The arm finger painting, remember? Everything starts to make sense as you play, and for all of Anomaly's complexity, there's nothing that feels out of place. And you can customize how complex you want the experience to be. Don't like hunger, sleep, or dehydration? Turn them off. Don't like crafting or cooking? Ignore them. Buy what you like. Let's talk about Anomaly settings. You like customization? You like sliding the sliders and toggling the options like baby's first play center? Well, there's a metric ton of settings in Anomaly. I've never seen so many settings in a game. I don't want to hear any wah wahs about the game being too hard or too easy or crafting or cooking being too onerous. Sure, they're not perfect, but if you don't like them, don't use them. Wait for a mod which does the stuff you like in the way you like. 
Anomaly shames most games in its honest attempt to bend over backwards and give you the perfect stalker experience. And new mods are released every week, updating or changing the experience in some way. Hell, there's even warfare and zombie mode selectable when you start a new game. So, all these options, that's great. But what does it actually mean? I'm so glad you asked. Let's take a look, shall we? Time for another story. Grab your orange slice, cross those legs, and enjoy. Later in my playthrough, I was walking down a pitted road toward the setting sun. The sky was already a deep purple, and the last warming rays retreated from the world. I was weary from exploration, the heavy pack cutting into my shoulders a testament to success. Time to head back to base to hydrate, eat, and catch some Z's. The shushing wind, vocal until now, suddenly held its breath and a sense of foreboding settled on me. A chilling roar was the only warning before claws gouged armor. The creature flashed by and I caught sight of the bloodied tentacles around its maw. A bloodsucker, hideous looking creatures and dangerous in the dark. Then another roar and another gouge. A second creature, the realization froze my blood to ice. I staggered and fired blindly, but the creatures were too quick and melted into the darkness. I was bleeding bad from multiple wounds and I dared not lower my weapon. I heard them round for another attack, intent on finishing me, their slobbering wet gasps sucking away my calm. I don't know how many panic shots I fired, but one of the creatures suddenly appeared in front of me as it tumbled to the ground, dead. One left. I clumsily dodged an attack, fighting the pain, and lined the remaining bloodsucker in my sights, finger poised on the trigger. I never saw it coming. A sharp, searing pain raked down my back as claws shredded armor. Three bloodsuckers, I realized, not two. They were hunting as a pack, and they were clinically tearing me to pieces. To think that only 15 seconds ago I had felt like a walking tank in my Nosgoroth exosuit. I was bleeding out, and they knew it. I could hear them salivate at the prospect of fresh blood. I had found a tourniquet at some point and had been saving it for a dire occasion. This seemed to qualify. Stumbling to keep a tree between myself and the creatures, I tightened the tourniquet and tended my wounds, wearing a couple more glancing slashes in the process. It was deep twilight, and all I could see of the creatures were two pairs of glowing eyes charging toward me. The creatures would appear a split second before the attack then turn invisible and fade into the darkness before I could aim. If we stuck to this dance, I'd run out of healing. I baited one to attack, sacrificing a hit to land a killing shot between the eyes. The creature slumped at my feet. It was a bad move. The final creature used the distraction to circle around and was upon me, enlivened by the fresh smell of blood. It seized me in powerful hands and sank its teeth into my neck, draining my already flagging strength. Sensing that this could be the end, I gathered my remaining fear-induced might and threw it off. It roared at me and bounced back into the darkness. I quickly bandaged the fresh wound, grimacing as the disinfectant went to work. I was weak, and it knew, but I only needed one shot. The bloodsucker circled around, then charged. But I was waiting for it, the mortal peril heightening my hearing and sight. I dodged around a tree, spun and fired at the fading humanoid shadow. The creature howled and sprawled face first. I limped over, warily glancing around as I harvested my trophies. Then I limped back to base to rest and share my harrowing tale over a vodka. This is just another of the many flash fiction tales I experienced while playing Anomaly. Unscripted, unplanned. A confluence of events which, in these situations, challenged my greed. Anomaly gives you moments like these. You don't need to chase them. Like all things in the zone, they'll find you. But there are also quiet moments of reflection, equally engaging in their terse stillness. Anomaly is part choose your own adventure, part ghost story, part action adventure thrill ride. When stalkers gather around the fire and shoot the shit, you know that they're talking about stuff like this. 
even if you don't speak Russian. Survival sits at the core of everything. Anomaly doesn't demand you pay attention to the survival aspect. It's so casual about this aspect that you might be lulled into a false sense of shooter bravado when taking your first steps into the zone. Anomaly never slaps you over the head and says, you're doing it wrong. It lets you prod and play and engage, and the world provides feedback on your decisions. Every encounter is a test. Do you know enough to continue with your current actions? Should you turn back? Do you even know enough to assess the risk? That dog looks a bit different to the rest, but it's just a dog, right? So why is your screen turning hazy? And why are there now three identical dogs rushing at you and oh god, you're dead. Veterans are smirking right now. Don't deny it, I see you. But a rookie stalker won't know a pseudo dog from a blind dog. Anomaly doesn't preach or lead, it demonstrates. Each death is a revelation. Sometimes you learn something new. Sometimes you relearn something you should already have known. People might compare this rhythm to a Souls game, and there are similarities, but Stalker is much more gear dependent. There are no stats to boost. Knowledge can only get you so far, and it won't help you survive the shot from that monolith sniper you didn't see. It won't save you from the baking patches of radiation. Gearing up is a big part of Stalker's appeal because it feels earned. You need to complete a lot of tasks and get your hands dirty to earn that first decent suit of armor. Ditto for weapons, and even more so if you're playing on the highest progression difficulty, which jacks up the price of all goods and basically turns trading in the zone into a black market. Not that it wasn't already, but the prices will reflect that, I promise you. Your privilege to survive here is a balance of tenacity, cunning, and information. Emissions and psi storms are the tick-tock heartbeat of the zone. Maximize loot or freedom of movement. That is the dichotomy. Seems like a silly question. The loot game is paramount until you're caught in the middle of a swamp, overburdened and far from cover when your PDA begins to crackle. Have you got an adrenaline shot? An energy drink? A caffeine tablet? Even the smallest advantage makes the biggest difference. Anomaly is backed by the amazing soundtrack of the original games, supplemented with new tracks by creator Gates of Morheim. Gates of Morheim has become a composer to watch with these new tracks. They blend with the old, capturing tone and timber perfectly. I honestly didn't pick them the first listen through, and Stalker's soundtrack has a very specific quality. I struggled to put that quality into words. It'd probably help if I knew music theory. All right, jumping on my soapbox for a minute. Where's the love for Stalker's soundtrack? Sure, among the fan base, it's almost universally adored, but you rarely hear anyone talk about it outside the community. Why the hell is that? Gameplay and soundtrack are inextricably entwined, with the music fueling a bassy, brooding undercurrent that lays additional tension onto the experience. I can't play Stalker without it, and it's become a go-to OST when writing apocalyptic content. Right up there with the Fallout 1 and 2 soundtracks for immersion. Stalker's soundtrack has a distinct voice, incorporating a bassy subtrack with notes of industrial. Growls and ghostly sounds highlight many tracks, building an almost supernatural feel to the environment, which is entirely on point for the setting. It's hard to say whether the threatening setting complements the music, or vice versa. It's a subdued component, sitting just below the core experience like a malevolent predator, muscles taut and snarl peeled back, waiting to leap. It's an expertly implemented component of gameplay which continues to pluck the string of tension, especially during the quiet moments. Stalker's soundtrack deserves mention in the same nostalgic vein as any of Jeremy Soule, Michael McCann or Jesper Kidd's work for accomplishing so well what it was designed to do. Why does a composer need a sweeping orchestral score to receive acclaim? Speaking of other criminally lesser known composers, give Kai Rosencrantz of Gothic and Risen fame a listen. The Gothic and Risen soundtracks are amazing. Inject, relax, enjoy. You're welcome. The soapbox just broke, rant over. The crafting system is a natural addition and can save you rubles. Maybe you're a compulsive hoarder, like me, and keep all the junk you find. The good news is that most of it is usable. The bad news is that you're not an MIT engineer. 
you'll need to find recipes and learn how to craft many of the advanced items. It's a great way to get decent armor and guns, but you'll need repair kits and components to fulfill your Cinderella moment. I know, I know, this sounds like work. It is, but the payoff is a good weapon repaired below market value, and the satisfaction of earned progression. No, not pride and accomplishment, I said earned progression. Save some coin for the ammo and meds you'll need. Or, you could just buy the damn gun. A decent early game shotgun begins at around 15,000 rubles. You might make that much doing a few tasks. If you don't eat, or drink, or shoot, or heal. Getting the picture? Gunplay is more refined than the original titles. Bullets not only go where they should, but they do crippling damage. As do all attacks, really. I wasn't joking when I said you could be two shot by a boar, a common early annoyance. Stronger mutants will have you in one go. And human opponents? A lone, well-armed and armoured stalker is formidable, especially when they get the drop on you. But, like the elderly, they usually come in pairs or a small group. Have you got a plan? You'll need one. You could try sniping to thin the group. Or perhaps you're the sneaky type, walking brashly into their camp in disguise. Maybe you plant a proximity mine, then toss a grenade into the group and watch the fireworks. Environments and game mechanisms encourage play. Charging in is always an option, but you no longer have to take the best worst option. More tools means more options, and more options means a more varied and nuanced gaming experience. Be as creative as you like. Or not. Lean on meds, artifacts and armor for protection as you stalk through enemy encampments, pumping round after round into your rivals. Craft your own victory or defeat. Your success rides on knowledge and gear. And when you've risen above mere mortals and think you've figured it all out, envious eyes turn toward you. You've made a name. You've made enemies. Enemies who want you dead. Enemies who pay a lot of money to hire heavily armed bounty hunters. Ironically, the sort of work you used to do, and perhaps still do. They'll find you. You better hope you're not exhausted and battered from another fight. Or worse yet, overburdened. Even fame has weight in Anomaly. You don't begin well known. You're very unknown, in fact. Just a fresh-faced rookie with lofty ambitions, an army surplus skivvy, granddad's knife from the war, and a cheap pistol. No one trusts you. No one likes you. And frosty Russian indifference is the warmest response you'll get from most. You haven't earned the hardened squint that comes with practice. You haven't developed the sixth sense for detecting anomalies. You haven't threaded that oh-so-fine needle through a tight cluster of electro-anomalies to gingerly claim the radioactive lump of unidentified material in the centre. You've earned nothing, and it's written in every line of you. You're no hero. You're not here to change the world, are you? Why are you here? Altruistic ambition? Is it wealth you seek? Fame, perhaps? Curiosity and a thirst for mystery? We'll find out, won't we? And so will you. Anomaly's main story is split into three distinct chapters. Veterans will recognize a recurring name, Strelok. This is a great mode for beginners as it gives direction and additional motivation to exploration. That's a lot of shuns. Early story tasks retrace the steps from Shadow of Chernobyl. I won't lie, it had me worried for a while that this was everything the story would conjure but thankfully it deviates further along. I'd like to say it was for the better, and there are highlights, but we'll get to that shortly. Story mode is fine if you need an external motivator to fuel exploration other than digging through every hole in Anomaly Cluster. You can absolutely poke around if that's your jam, it's actively encouraged. This blondie did, and he had a hell of a time with it. The story isn't without fault, you probably gathered that. The early story is too much a retread of Shadow of Chernobyl, and there's little impetus or urgency to push through. I forgot about it for a long time, and enjoyed exploring the zone all over again. The first few tasks boiled down to, Sorry bro, Strelok ain't here, why don't you go look for him at blah location? 
It needed more mystery, something firm to grip and shake with the teeth. Is the world going to end? Is Strelik in danger? Do we encounter sinister agents on his tail who have a chilling or fatal motives? Give me something tangible! When the plot finally deviates, it devolves into a tiresome slog backward and forward through familiar territory, punctuated by combat to break the monotony of travel. The characters are flat and remain largely unchanged by events. This does make some sense, but it feels too safe, especially given how multifaceted Strelok's motivations had the potential to be. The later two story chapters introduce a couple of new factions, which had narrative promise, but are let down by one-dimensional storytelling. It's in these chapters that the modders stray from the Stalker formula to impose threat upon the player. Stalker's difficulty has always been a function of progression. Low-level gear is underpowered and unsuitable for expeditions deep into the zone. Better weapons and armor are a rite of passage, earned in blood. The challenge of enemy stalkers deeper in the zone is their gear, heavy armor and high caliber weapons with penetrating rounds. It's a mechanical feature with logical weight, only the best equipped survive here. The Sin faction throws this out the window in favor of enemy sponginess, the uh, cardinal Sin of gaming. <laughs> sin eat round after round like delicious buttery popcorn, and they stagger less often. Fighting them is more challenging, but in a frustrating way, as the systems that you have been groomed to rely on no longer apply. They forcibly become as dangerous as Monolith, even though they sometimes appear less geared. Monolith and Sin share the same buff in damage and resistance, but it's more credible with Monolith thanks to the higher level gear they carry, which reinforces the illusion. Sin, on the other hand, often wear lighter armor than Monolith, a trench coat in some cases which breaks the illusion like a fart in a flower store. I want to call Sin what I think it is, a lazy addition, but I keep coming back to the fact that the modders were working with an engine that they didn't code. Anomaly is a passion project. Criticizing work that people aren't making a dollar off just makes me feel like a prick. Instead, I'll say that Sin are a missed opportunity at adding a potentially interesting faction to the stalker universe. There was genuine intent here, and it's a shame the idea wasn't pushed further. Sin reveal themselves as a sleeper group, watching from the shadows, rarely interfering, building their forces until the time is right. It would have been more unsettling to see this trend adopted throughout the main story and beyond. Sin sleeper agents could be planted in each of the other factions, waiting for an opportune time to reveal themselves and attack. This could have been a dynamic system, that loner you recruited looks trustworthy, but perhaps he's amiable because he doesn't want to raise suspicion. Perhaps he'll wait until you're in the middle of the Great Swamp, bleeding and irradiated and out of meds, to reveal his affiliation and strike. This behavior feels much more in line with Sin's credo, and could have created tense moments of distrust in the most unlikely situations. Suddenly, traveling alone doesn't sound so unappealing. This sort of mechanic would be taking a leaf from John Carpenter's book in his movie The Thing, where anyone could be possessed by a strange alien creature. In this case, just a fanatic cult called Sin. But the effect that it would have on gameplay and the psyche of the player would be a perfect fit for the zone. If Sin are lazy, then Unisig and Renegades are flat out unnecessary. I don't know why they exist. We have ecologists, the military, and bandits. We didn't need to mash them together to create factions. Perhaps there is more to playing them. Maybe I'll do a run with them at some point. Narratively, they're just a new badge to shoot at. You'll unlock Sin, Renegades, and Unisig as playable factions as you complete chapters of the main story. Don't delete that save file. And while we're talking about factions, there are already plenty of them to populate the zone and all can be chosen as your starting faction. Each faction presents its own challenges, and you can complicate the hell out of this by randomizing your starting location. Don't like your faction, or have a change of heart mid-game? No problem! Track down a faction leader and dial up the charm. Eventually, they might like you enough to recruit you under their badge. Masochists are also catered for. Iron Man mode is the anomaly gut check. You die, your save is wiped. 
Maybe give yourself a couple of lives for the odd mistake. Perhaps grant yourself an additional life every day or two. Or perhaps you want to activate a Zazzle mode and jump into the boots of a random stalker when you die. Anomaly also heard you like achievements. 20 of them are built into the game and precisely none of them are cosmetic. All grant something nice when unlocked and they're with you for the rest of the playthrough. Some even follow you into new games like Love Hungry Puppies. You can chase them down for the bonuses or ignore them entirely, your choice. But they add a nice incentive to poke around and get active. If you're not tired of zombies already, Anomaly has you covered here too. Turn on survival mode to change all spawns to zombies. Well, not all spawns, as I found out, but you'll see a lot of zombies. It begs a different style of play. How long can you survive? Zombie mode is interesting, if not exactly novel, but it detracts from the core experience. The variety of mutants and stalkers are what make for an interesting and dynamic experience. Survival mode drastically reduces the numbers of both and inserts the most sluggish enemy. Zombies are easily avoided and they water down the danger to a brackish slurry. I never felt overly pressured or in peril around them, and this changes the rhythm of gameplay for the worse. The loot game also suffers as zombies often carry wads of cash, guns, ammo, food and meds. Perhaps I need to spend more time with this mode to fully appreciate what it offers, but I doubt I'll find more than what I initially saw. There is a story to be told in survival mode. Some traders, technicians and other prominent people vanish or can be killed, meaning that you may have to lean on heavier use of crafting. I may explore this mode on my Let's Play channel, Blondfire, in the future. It has potential and I'm hoping that a visionary modder will refine this mode and balance the gameplay aspects to instill a greater sense of apocalypse and survival. There's also Warfare Mode, if pure combat is more your shtick. It pits faction against faction in a hostile tug of war. Capturing checkpoints and helping your faction hold ground is the name of the game. This mode can be enabled alongside Story Mode, and it can drastically alter your progress through the zone. Early game combat is predictably brutal, but the spoils of war will fuel your progress in a way that the vanilla campaign can't. It's a faster, more exciting burn, and you can focus as much attention on it as you like. Downside? Of course there's a downside. Ignoring the plight of your faction means that the faction base you left 20 minutes ago may not be manned by friendly faces when you return, and this can significantly disrupt progress. There's a push-pull to this mode, and enabling it means keeping a constant eye on how your faction is holding up. Thrill seekers will enjoy the constant threat of violence. Explorers will find it an unending distraction. You can mix and match a lot of these modes. The level of customization is truly staggering. Upend a bottle of vodka, staggering. I can't get over the fact that they let you adjust the moon phases. That's, th that's just nuts. We've discussed plot, but environmental storytelling and emergent gameplay are the real stars of the show. Every region shows signs of struggle, both recent and past, of the mad scramble to leave the zone and the frenzied push to return, and the daily struggles to continue. And with every step and decision, you craft a story. You've heard some of mine. Perhaps you'll travel those same areas and your journey is quiet, uneventful. Then again, perhaps not. By the time you return to a campfire, surrounded by Russian camaraderie and laughter, you'll feel as though you've earned your place in that warmth. Eventually, you'll be balls deep in trouble, and the ghost stories and nail-biting tales of your fireside friends will become that much more relatable. The zone takes a part of you, but it gives much more in return. When Anomaly fires on all cylinders, it immerses you in its world effortlessly. As with many of the games I enjoy, Anomaly's journey is the irresistible allure. The technical systems are cohesively welded to the clanky body of Stalker, but the world lines are so masterfully applied that you won't know where the original game ends and the new content begins. It's easy to craft your own directive for play or impose restrictions to crank up the challenge. It's the sort of experience where you decide if it's really worth bringing four lead containers when they weigh two kilograms each. 
It's the sort of game where you weigh the purchase of a new assault rifle and a single clip of ammo against fixing your pistol and buying a few clips and some healing meds with the change. It's the sort of game where you risk being hopelessly overburdened and hopped up on caffeine for the chance of a sweet, sweet loot payoff. It's the sort of game that invokes morbid wonder and a sense of loss at departed civilization and the dog-eat-dog -dog microcosm that has sprung up in its place. It's the sort of game that presents a dark, cement-lined hole in the earth, draped in burnt fuzz, and says with a Cheshire grin, Wanna come inside? You can relax every aspect of difficulty, and if you enjoy your experience that way and don't want to fuss with carry weight, then you can, and power to you. But, Stalker is at its best when it challenges you, pushes you to the boundary of your perceived limits, then squeezes a little harder. You'll surprise yourself. You'll surprise others. Survival in the zone is tough, and earning your place is a badge of honor. Craft your own story. Forge your own destiny. Alright, I've waxed lyrical long enough. Let's talk about the fuzzy side of the experience, the unwashed side that catches all the dust and chewing gum and smells like wet dog. Anomaly is good, great even, but it ain't perfect. While usually stable, it crashed often enough that I wouldn't want to play hardcore modes with limited save options, and that's without mods. Stir in a few user-made quality of life improvements and stability has the potential to seesaw. The zone is resistant to outside interference, you see. Companion AI is particularly sketchy. Sometimes your well-armed buddy will double tap that bandit you failed to spot 50 meters away. Other times he'll unload on a blind dog at close range and need to reload twice before the job is done. If he survives. I've seen companions dumbly dance around while being eaten a bite at a time by wildcats, flatly refusing to defend themselves despite being told to attack. They also absolutely do not give a crap about your well-being. They'll shoot through you to hit enemies and they rarely pop a single shot, so expect to have your bleached tush shot to pieces if you stray into their crosshair. They'll also chase enemies long distances, ignoring commands to stay close and racing across the map to a certain and well-deserved death. Too bad you asked them to carry all your stuff. They're also pushy bastards. They jostle you if you're standing still. Taking them into situations that require fine manoeuvring is a death sentence. For you, not them, they don't trigger anomalies. I've been nudged into anomalies, shoved from behind cover, even shoved into incoming attacks. It's like they know. They see my gear and they want that sweet juicy loot. Maybe there's a rhyme to this reason after all. Perhaps the message is clear. Trust no one. They also forest gump and run off. To where? Nobody knows, but it sure isn't to invest in a fruit company. And occasionally, they go on strike and refuse to move at all. You'll scream commands and run around like crazy trying to unstick them, and they just chill. I love the idea of companions, but the only stable function they serve is pack mule. Could have used 10 more minutes in the oven. There's a Gordon Ramsay quote for situations like this. Navigating the zone with a posse is a cool idea, and it's clear from the roaming groups of stalkers that this was expected to be a commonly used feature, group on group combat. Shame it doesn't shake out that way. Stalker is the perfect series to include a stealth system, and the mod creators have attempted one here, but the AI is all over the place and unreliable, and I wasn't game to enable this. There's even a disclaimer that the stealth option is purely experimental. This isn't a criticism leveled at the devs. Stalker has had these issues throughout the franchise. Sometimes hostiles spot a pixel of you through coarse foliage over 200 meters on a moonless night and will snipe your ass with a PM pistol. Other times you'll be mere meters from them waving a shotgun in their face and they'll stand there with a finger buried knuckle deep up their nose. The disguise system only makes stealth more confusing. Line of sight doesn't seem as important as proximity, but even then I was detected in places that should have been safe. There is a stealth system here and it is possible to creep on enemies, but don't expect Sam Fisher levels of covert. 
It's still incredibly rewarding to get the drop on someone or flank them and wipe out their group. It's just a shame that the consistency is lacking. The system's flaws are especially pointed given the steep difficulty, and it results in the odd situation where you do everything right and are still brutally punished because the AI found a sixth sense at the right moment. I enjoyed stealth more when I understood the idiosyncrasies and accepted it for what it was. A slightly less risky but satisfying means to an end. Then there's the harmless jank, which is more common. Like NPCs floating in the air. Or facing a crate or wall. Or sitting the wrong way on a chair. Or staring at a corner because they've been a bad boy. I fast travelled to the Xantar base and one of the main doors was jammed into the wall at a weird angle. When I opened it, it repositioned into the hinges and opened properly as though nothing weird had happened. The zone truly is a wondrous place. One recurring glitch stretched dead bodies into Slendermen and made this loud continuous stuttering noise when I was in earshot. This physics glitch made the radar base a pig to clear. This happened a couple of times and caused some pretty horrendous frame drop. The only way to clear it was to leave the area and come back in a day or two when the bodies had been cleared out. Let's talk economy balance. It feels off. Even on a high progression difficulty, it's more convenient to gear up by forking over cash. Sure, you can save some cash by crafting, but random loot and recipe drops mean that getting the components and recipes you need is a crapshoot and the time you spend looking for components could have gone toward recouping your losses had you just nutted up and bought your gear. Cooking is also underwhelming. Food is plentiful. Vendors sell it, enemies carry it, stashes hold it, you're never hard up for a meal. I guess the black market has trivialized the more mundane aspects of the zone survival. I'm more hopeful that these issues can be modded out as they would only require tweaking food item spawns and availability at vendors. This isn't jank, but I found Hip's inclusion strange. Not because she's a female stalker, but because she's the only female stalker. Her appearance highlights the absence of women in the zone, porn mags excluded. While I think stalker was fine the way it was, I have no problem with women in the zone. But stopping at one is strange. You wouldn't expect a 50-50 split, but seeing them in factions like the ecologists wouldn't be unheard of. But then, if we're talking strange, you'd have to comment on how everyone in the zone speaks Russian, despite Chernobyl being on Ukraine soil and the area attracting stalkers internationally. But that's a can of worms I ain't opening. There's no getting around what stalker anomaly is. An amalgamation of ideas which have been jammed into the stalker universe. That's descriptively crude, but Anomaly wears the influences unabashedly on its sleeve. The mechanisms which Anomaly has adopted aren't tossed into the mixing bowl for shits and giggles. They're logical. They're a seamless fit for the world and the existing gameplay loops. I mentioned before that if you're a returning stalker, but that it's been a while between drinks, you'd swear that this is how they've always played. That's not hyperbole. That's genuinely how it feels. The repair and condition system has been greatly expanded from the original titles. Anyone familiar with Escape from Tarkov will recognize gun components, which can be used in Anomaly to fix crappy guns and armor. Anomaly doesn't have the breadth of components and weapon customization that Tarkov does, but it could. People are already Tarkoving the Stalker experience with new mods. It's only a matter of time. The crafting system takes an item-starved approach a la the Metro franchise, allowing you to scavenge old gear for components which can then be crafted into something useful. There's already an economy of sorts in the zone, but crafting is the attractive way to save cash and build a side hustle crafting stuff to sell. I'd love to see an evolution of this system which could emulate true scarcity to make crafting even more attractive and prominent, which would shove the survival aspect to the fore. I wait, and hope, and dream. In another nod to the Metro franchise, Anomaly includes an old ammo variant for all ammo. Old ammo can still be fired, which degrades the weapon condition faster, or it can be crafted into new ammo at a 2 to 1 cost. 
Much like the crafting system, there's little impetus to make full use of this system as money is easier to come by after the first few hours, and you're never really that hard up for ammo. Settings can yeah, tweak the economy like and there may be a good balance where old ammo plays a more meaningful role, but on the preset difficulty, Fire ammo was you. never an issue. The bump in enemy and mutant damage and the increased reliability of gun accuracy results in intense tactical fights. Even a one-on-one -on -one with a mutant can become a life or death struggle, and it frequently does early on. For all of its faults, the Stalker AI frequently gets a lot of things right, and when the combat algorithm is firing on all cylinders, it's a visceral delight. Stalkers flush you out of cover with grenades, they flank you, they inflict crippling damage with high-powered weapons, and they push your position when you're outnumbered. They're generally good shots, especially the military or mercenaries, which often leads to pressure situations where you're pinned behind cover and making moment-to-moment -moment life and death decisions. These moments highlight just how good the emergent gameplay can be, and they're every bit as thrilling as they sound. The tactical and high-stakes gunplay, coupled with blood loss, in-the-field healing, radiation, and a host of other concerns, highlight the similarities in emergent survival gameplay between Stalker and Escape from Tarkov. Tarkov is a mere wish-granter and nuclear power plant away from a Stalker experience. Anomaly bridges that gap by applying a wrench to Stalker's existing systems and tightening the loose bits. It's not refined but it's a huge step up from the original experience. Did I mention mutants? Stalker can't be Stalker without mutants. There has always been a tenuous balance making mutants a credible threat, particularly late game when the player is fully geared. The devs address this challenge by boosting mutant spawns and damage and adding a bunch of new threats. If guns are the clinical finger of God, then mutants are the goddamn sledgehammer. Like Metro Exodus, there is a strategy in choosing your fights, which deplete resources or potentially end you. One-shot deaths are not uncommon, and seasoned players will skirt around hotspots, knowing full well what awaits the impulsively foolish. In another small tip of the hat to Metro, face masks ripple with water when it's raining, and they need to be wiped to see clearly. Even a small inclusion like this deepens the moment-to-moment -moment gunplay and broadens meaningful choices. Could Anomaly exist without these influences? I don't think so. Although Anomaly feels like an organic progression of the Stalker formula, it's still a bunch of hand-picked systems from other games bespoke for the Stalker framework. That isn't meant to cheapen the achievement here, on the contrary. What these guys have pulled off is damn impressive and on a scale I would never have imagined possible. Anomaly deserves to exist standalone. A testament to the vision and passion of its most devout fans, backed by generations of gaming experience. It seems appropriately iterative that Stalker served as the inspiration for a new wave of gritty Slavic shooters, and is now reaping the benefits of this shared growth. And it appears that GSC Gameworld, Stalker's developers, have kept their finger on the thunderous community pulse. Stalker 2's Ultimate Edition promo clearly shows an artifact container collectible, an item implemented outside the original games. This bodes well, and I'm now much more optimistic about the product that Stalker 2 could be, compared to the original Battle Royale style Snorfest that they revealed a few years ago. Thank the builder for community feedback. I'd pay full price for this game. I don't have to, it's a free mod, but I would. Stalker Anomaly is an emergent experience in a full-fledged package, complete with enough customizable settings to make AAA studios blush. And blush they should. I'm a fan of games that allow me to play by my own rules and carve my own experience, and Anomaly breaks its back to deliver exactly that. The sheer amount of customization means that with the simple tweak of settings you'll have a completely different experience. And that's not including randomized item spawns, stashes, NPCs, and mutants in every region of the zone. I restarted many times, trying different approaches, testing each location, and no two experiences were the same, even if the settings never changed. How many games can truly boast that? Anomaly's punishing combat sits nicely with me too. 
Like many knowledge-driven skill systems, the difficulty is steep in the beginning but is more appreciated once you grasp this strange new world. Progression is earned as a direct result of active player engagement. Stalkers and mutants have a stepped difficulty as you push further north, and while you might catch your toe on the steps a time or two, the experience is rarely unfair. Enemies aren't hard to figure out. Watch their patterns, look at their gear, and learn their tactics. There are no level systems to worry about. No need to wonder if you're in an area which is artificially beyond your abilities. The tactile feedback of encounters informs whether you and your gear are up to snuff, and this allows even undergeared players to succeed where gear alone isn't normally enough. And gear alone is never enough, existing on a gradient which never levels, not even for fully kitted stalkers. Gear enables you to survive long enough to make the right decisions, and those unwilling to learn are destined to fall, time after time. The story mode falls flat, but there's plenty enough mystery to chase down in each region. The story could have been built around natural curiosity by using points of interest as settings or plot devices to build mystery and lore. Are you telling me you couldn't build something cool off a location like the Kindergarten in the outskirts region? Come on guys. But instead, we're treated to an antagonist who is absent for most of the story, and their presence is never felt in the zone. Sin and Unisig had promised the standalone factions and plot devices for the main story, but neither reach for their potential, and they could have been substituted in the story for existing hostile factions. Anomaly's myriad systems are a familiar hardwood chair for Metro, Tarkov and Fallout fans. Unforgiving, but robust. Anomaly, though, offers a unique setting and experience that no game has faithfully replicated since the original Stalker trilogy. Even with a lackluster story, Anomaly is the most fully realized version of Stalker that I've played, and the slew of mods constantly released will continue to evolve this product. Yep, product, I said it. This mod is more feature complete than many AAA releases, and less buggy. As a storytelling medium, Anomaly appeals to the explorers, the adventurers, those who appreciate the journey more than the destination. If you played Red Dead Redemption 2 and spent more hours exploring, fishing, hunting and sightseeing than you did playing the main story, you'll find a similar pedestrian appeal in Stalker Anomaly. If you enjoyed the original Stalker trilogy, if you like watching game sunsets or marvel at the sun blazing shafts of light across the landscape, if fog or rain rolling through the countryside instills a sense of juxtaposed dread and opportunity, if learning about the zone's inhabitants and events intrigues you, if visceral combat quickens your pulse and warms the loins, if spelunking into spooky underground Soviet bases to answer the zone's many questions sounds like your idea of a good time, if you play games for the joy of seeing your own story unfold, even in the absence of a strong narrative, or perhaps in the absence of any narrative, if you're the sort of gamer who becomes fully absorbed in an experience, if any of these things sound like you, then you owe it to yourself to play Stalker Anomaly. The zone is indelible. It'll be with you long after you believe you're finished. And if some of these things appeal to you, what have you got to lose? The damn thing is free. Psh, <laughs> mod my ass. Not mod my ass, I mean mod, comma, my ass. You can leave now. Slap that like button on the way out, would you? Cheers.